Thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, can you see my slide already? Yes. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so welcome to the lecture series as a, uh, Professor Yangpo has already introduced. So the lecture series is co-organized by uh, the two uh, organizers. Uh, first is Department of Economics of Education and uh, Administration, Graduate School of Education, Peking University, and the Higher Education Group, Faculty of Management and Business, Temporary University, where I am from. So the topic or the theme of the theories is uh, called uh, Organization and the Management in Higher Education. The purpose of the lecture series is to promote and advance applications of organization and management theories in higher education by inviting distinguished scholars to share their expert views and interact with the researchers and the students in the field. We also expect the lecture and the lecture recordings can be used as a supplementary materials in doctor and master degree courses on higher education administration, higher education studies, as well as public administration. At Peking University, the lecture series is part of the Graduate School of Education's most distinguished school-wide lecture program titled Peking University Education the program is a consorted effort of various departments at the GSE to introduce internationally renowned scholars to graduate students, to broaden their horizons, and to directly interact with the leading researchers in the fields. The Graduate School of Education has invited scholars from various disciplines to give lectures in the program, such as Professor Andy Green from UCL LOE, Professor Samuel Maginson from Oxford University, Professor Susan Loop from the Brown University, and Professor Bryn Jacob from University of Michigan. The lecture program has already become a symbol of excellence in China's education and public policy research. At Tampere University, the lecture series is part of the activities of the Sino-Finnish Education Research Center, which is part of the six centers of the Sino-Finnish Joint Learning Innovation Institute, a research network involving more than 20 universities from both China and Finland. The center also organizes other webinar series, such as the Sino-Finnish Education and Society, Learning Education Science in Finland and the Sino or China Europe Innovation and Sustainable Development Cooperation. All the activities of the center receive financial support from the Global Innovation Network for Teaching and Learning. The network uh, is initiated by the Finnish Ministry of uh, Education. So, in the network, Finnish Universities, together with their partners from India, China, and Africa, co create research based solutions to global education challenges and they collaborate in research and education. Since we have the lecture series called Organization and Management in Higher Education. So I shortly discuss about the relations between organization management theory and higher education research. So the two uh, domains are interrelated, have a reciprocal effect on each other. So on the one hand, as we know, organization theories have already gained solid ground in higher education research. On the other hand, several major, major modern organization theories such as research dependency theory, the garbage can model, the loose coupling concept, and the several insights of institutional theory are built upon the research on universities or 
education organization institutions in general. We also hope uh, the webinar or the lecture series can help resolve a challenge or dilemma in studies of organization and the management series in higher education. So on the one hand, uh, we know that many organization and the management series are mainly based on the Western experience. On the other hand, researchers struggle to understand some intriguing but complicated phenomenon in non-Western context due to uh, proper theoretical lenses. Both challenges can be overcome by further enhancing the Western-oriented theories through critically reflecting them through examining practices in non-Western context. So now we talk about the uh, uh, lecture organization. So for each uh, lecture, it's, it's organized as such. Uh, before the lecture, we are going to announce uh, the lecture schedule together with suggested reading material. So the audience can study uh, the, uh, the reading list provided the, the lecture. During the lecture, we have two parts. Uh, the presentation is 40 minutes, then it's followed by 40, uh, 45 minutes discussions. After the lecture, we are going to share the lecture recording on the Sino Finnish Education Research website located at Temple University. We also expect that the uh, recordings or the lecture materials can be integrated in different uh, degree education programs. Finally, I have some pre-announcement uh, for the upcoming lectures by the end of this year. We still have some lectures to be scheduled in 2023, but these are the lectures uh, we have already you know, uh, fixed the dates. We are going to announce the lectures on our website. Uh, I think I can uh, stop here, but pay attention to our announcement. Uh, please do follow our upcoming lectures. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Tsai, for this very uh, comprehensive introduction to the lecture series, including our host of our organizations, and also the schedule or the preview of the very interesting schedule for the semester. So now uh, uh, let me have the uh, privilege to introduce to you the presenter of today's lecture. Uh, professor Lumro Pinheiro is a professor of public policy and administration uh, from University of Agro from Novi. No, Novi. He's also the deputy head of the department and member of the research group on public governance and leadership. He's also a member of the Centers for Digital Transformation, Advanced Studies in Regional Innovation Strategy and the Jean Monnet Center for Excellence, all based in the university. His research interests are located in the intersection of the public policy and administration, organizational studies, economic geography, innovation, and higher education studies. Uh, among his many of the achievements, I think the most interesting one are the presentation today, which is looking into the uh, sustainable future of universities, particularly from the concept of the resilient university. So please, uh, the floor is your, yours, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Young, and thank you so much, Professor Chai, for the kind invitation to be the the kickoff of these very exciting theories is a privilege and an honor, but also a pressure because now I'm setting the stage for, for the next lectures. I also want to thank all of you for having taken time from your previous, uh, from your tight schedule, as I know it's quite already late in the, getting late in the, in the evening in, uh, in Beijing. And I see that we have uh, colleagues from all over the world. And a special thanks to the study group that Professor Young put together uh, earlier this week, uh, which, uh, have uh, reacted to the readings that I have um, recommended and um, you know, put together a series of very, very uh, tough questions, which I will try to address uh, as much as possible uh, uh, during the lecture and during the presentation. Uh, so what I want to do today is basically three things. I want to set up the, you know, uh, the type of analytical lens that I'm using to approach higher education systems. 
Um, this is also the feedback I received from the students, some clarification on resilience theory, resilience thinking, and I'll do that by looking at systems thinking. Then I'll um, contextualize this notion of resilience in the social sciences, which is an important uh, discussion. Um, really address also why is there such an interest on resilience and why now, um, which perhaps is a given, but it's always good to, to, to remind. Uh, and then really jump with some examples on resilience in higher education uh, as an emergent um, uh, aspect. Um, and then conclude uh, with, with, you know, with some thoughts about resilience and you know, a, a short epilogue if we have time with some more uh, recommendations, uh, practical recommendations for managers and, and, um, and, and policy makers. All right, so let's ju just jump right in. Um, some words on systems thinking and resilience. So um, systems thinking and resilience thinking are tightly connected. Um, according to Walker and Salt, a major author in this area, resilience thinking is systems thinking. So then the question, what is systems thinking? Well, let's start with the definition of a system. What is a system? Well, a system is an interconnected set of elements that is organized in a way to accomplish or to achieve something. So to get a function for some purpose. This is the classic definition by Donatella Meadows, a very famous person also uh, within the field. So taking this perspective, then we could move down to resilience as defined by one of maybe the grandfather of resilience studies, uh, Holling, which then defines resilience as the persistence of relationships within the system and a measure of the ability of these systems to absorb changes and still persist, okay? Um, Walker and Salt build on this definition and try to clarify and simplify it, which I really like, and define resilience as the ability uh, of a system or, or an aspect of a system, a subsystem, to retain both function and identity while adapting to emergency circumstances. And we'll come back to this definition uh, later on. It's also important to highlight that systems thinking also represents a paradigm shift. Is it, it is a critique of what is called normal science. A normal science is, uh, science is dominated by the Newtonian, model of science, and amongst other things, it's um, centered on something that is called analytical reductionism, right? The way of understanding one phenomenon is by isolating it from the parts. And I think this is perhaps something that resonates particularly with a non-Western audience, right? The holistic perspective, the yin and yang, that it's so, uh, as far as I know, so prevalent in Confucian societies. So um, systems thinking critiques uh, Newtonian science because one of the things that once we isolate the parts and, and, and systems thinkers understand the need to isolate the parts to understand complexity, but it's important to, once we look at the trees, step back and look at how the trees is uh, incorporated within the context of the forest and interacts with other trees and other organisms and so on, right? So uh, the example is, uh, you know, for example, the studies in medicine, the study of the heart, and then taking a perspective that the heart is a core component as part of a much larger and complex cardiovascular system. So what are the central themes um, and key concepts um, around systems and resilient thinking? Three central themes. So one is this notion of threshold and regime shift, right? So what are thresholds and regime shifts? Those are boundaries that systems have uh, after which uh, system dynamics take a different uh, nature and, and a different function. So uh, let's think about a forest, for example, right? So a forest, if a forest is a forest, as long as there are certain dynamics that define it to be the forest, right? There are trees, there are certain elements of humidity, some ability to regenerate, some mix of fauna and flora. Um, but we know historically many forests, like the, the Sahara Desert, the Grand Canyon, were actually oceans as well, became deserts as a result of natural process of climate change. When they move from forest to deserts, they pass a threshold. They become a different entity with a different function and a different identity, okay? So uh, thresholds are these boundaries uh, after which we can no longer recognize an entity as it used to be recognized and for which system dynamics as we know it can no longer provide an answer. And this is called a regime shift. Oftentimes it's irrevertible. So once an entity, for example, in an ecosystem passes the regime shift, it cannot go back, but oftentimes um, it's possible. A second central theme is the idea of feedback loops, right? 
So uh, systems are composed of many different components, and these components react to one another. And there are aspects that are emergent. Um, there are both positive and negative feedback loops. Let me give you an example. Climate change, right? So we all know that the Arctic is uh, melting. Uh, the glaciers are melting faster than uh, we anticipated. Uh, there is a positive feedback loop with this melting because there are two things. As the Arctic melts, there's more um, uh, you know, non-salty water that mixes with salty water, which reduces the condensation of the salty water, which then affects, uh, amongst other things, uh, you know, currents um, and, and winds and so on. But most importantly, as the glaciers melt, they become darker. So uh, when they are in an icy form, they are white, and the white reflects uh, heat outside our atmosphere. So as the glaciers melt, they become darker and they absorb more heat, which then means that the atmosphere and the oceans absorb more heat. So there's a positive feedback loop, uh, you know, uh, reinforcing the system dynamic for uh, for uh, climate change and the you know a gradual uh, increase in in oceans and so on, um, ocean level. The third central theme is the idea of adaptive cycles. So it's important to highlight that systems have their own natural way of bouncing forward and, 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 and moving and changing over time, right? Uh, some of these systems, some of these adaptive cycles are more incremental, right? Associated with adaptive mechanisms. Others are more radical. When they are more radical, they get closer to these regime change or regime shifts. Uh, so the classic example that is given in the book is that of a basin, you know, say the swimming pool or a lake, and there's a ball at the bottom of the lake and the ball moves back and forth, right? Those are the adaptive cycles to be related to the tides and so on. Um, but there is a threshold for which if the ball goes outside um, that particular, uh, you know, um, threshold, uh, it may affect the dynamic of the system. Um, however, uh, Part of the adaptive cycle also means that the thresholds themselves can also move, right? So the ball can move to a point where maybe in a previous regime was considered to be a regime shift, and today is no longer a regime shift because the boundaries have been enlarged. Okay, um, I know this is quite abstract, but I'll try to, uh, to bring some empirical examples uh, later on. Um, and some of the key mechanisms or concepts. So diversity, healthy ecosystems, are diverse ecosystems. This comes from the natural science, but also applies uh, for social sciences as well. Uh, we know all of us at university working with group, at least as a, as a teacher, I always say to my students, I have diverse groups, right? Uh, three brains think better than two brains, right? Or one brain alone, right? So diversity, at least a priority, all things being equal, uh, is an important element in diverse systems are important because they have different mechanisms of response. So when a system faces adversity, the more diversity you have, the more ideas, the more repositories to provide different types of responses to that adversity, which goes back to the second concept of uh, system thinking or resilient thinking, which is Slack. Slack is, say, at the kind of a, uh, repositories of, of energy that systems have, which they can be used right, in case uh, when they are facing adversity. So imagine, for example, uh, uh, the electric cars that we all now starting to drive, they all have a little slack. So when it says that the car is 10%, actually most manufacturers put a 5% more, so then you actually don't stop, right? So it's an additional energy that you have. Um, and the reason why this is a, an important component, again, is because slack gives you that extra uh, it could be ideas, it could be energy, it could be resources, skills uh, that systems need when facing uh, adaptation. And managers hate Slack because Slack is costly, right? We'll come back to that in a second. The third concept is loose coupling, right? So the notion that a system is composed by different types of uh, subsystems and that these systems are loosely coupled. This should not be confused with decoupled, right? So these systems still interact in, in, in specific ways, but what happens in one system does not ne necessarily uh, affect other part of the system, right? So the systems are relatively independent and they have independent boundaries to a degree. The third, fourth element or concept is self-organization, right? So a certain degree of autonomous, these systems are not dependent of a, a major central entity, but they are self-organized. And lastly, the concept of emergence, right? So systems thinking, and this is also something that, um, uh, it's another critique to the Newtonian model is 
nonlinear, meaning that over time, there are specific features, including feedback loops that emerge that are unpredictable. And small inputs may have considerable um, impact on uh, the output, as we have seen recently with, for example, you know, a cargo ship being sucked in the Panama Canal, which is a relatively small input, which is able then to disrupt a global value chain all over the world. Okay, then let's ask this question. How has resilience migrated uh, into the social sciences? Because this is an important discussion and it relates to something in science we call uh, concept stretching, right? Or conceptual stretching. Uh, resilience emerged primarily from the hard sciences, right? The engineering and the physical sciences. They were really the early adopters. So the idea was to represent how materials, in this case, in nature, uh, um, you know, when face pressure have certain ability to adapt through elasticity, right? Um, for example, steel at high temperatures, right? Um, bridge vibrations, right? We all know that if bridge don't, bridges don't vibrate, they will break, right? So they have the vibrations that simulate the, the tensions and, and the fluctuations and so on and are necessary. Um, but then engineers need to calculate what is the threshold of vibrations that is allowed for a bridge to be safe to cross, right? After that, the bridge may collapse. Uh, also a key aspect of this engineering view of resilience is this idea of bouncing back to a previous state, right? So it's always assumed, you know, uh, you know, once you stop heating the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the material, uh, you know, if it's cold, like it's often here in Norway in the winter, uh, you know, if you stop providing heat to, uh, you know, to, to, to ice, it goes back to, to ice from water, right? So this idea of bouncing back to a previous state. Uh, and the focus is very much according to Holling says efficiency of function, right? So the best, a way of organizing a system to provide efficiency. Now, ecosystem or social resilience has a different take. The focus is less on efficiency of function, so the best way to develop a system and bouncing back to previous state, and uh, focusing on reorganization and persistence, or what Holling calls the maintenance of function, right? So an ecosystem perspective is maybe less concerned with efficiency of the system, but with the way in which the system is organized to guarantee function over time, particularly when facing adversities, right? So a good example here is uh, the financial global, global financial markets, right? Uh, or global value chains. They are organized uh, using methodologies such as just in time, for example, where you know the wheels and the lamps of uh, cars or computers get into a factory, and then they provide as inputs to another manufacturing process, and then someone else picks up and builds on that, and then in the end, you have a computer or you have a car. What happens when one of those elements collapses, which is what has happened with COVID, the whole process collapses, right? So it was a very efficient system in the short term, but not a very resilient system in the long or medium term when facing adversity, right? So a system uh, that would be designed to maintain function, for example, would have created redundancies, so there will be some manufacturers who will have some lambs or some sheep stored somewhere, right? The slack that I mentioned earlier to prevent these, uh, uh, you know, these these from happening. And the idea is less on bouncing back, but on bouncing forward. So how can you bouncing forward? So after a crisis, after event in a post-COVID world, right? How can we bounce forward while still retaining function and identity, right? So our social systems, you know, governments, universities, hospitals still operate as they used to operate, but something was learned, right, from the adversity, say, of COVID-19, hopefully. Now, together with some colleagues, my colleague, um, Maria Laura Frigotto from Italy and uh, Mitchell Young from the Czech Republic, we have published a volume um, which is open access, so all of you can, can access um, this year um, on resilience within organizations, right? So actually it's broader and it's an attempt to have an interdisciplinary discussion. So there's still an ongoing discussion within resilient studies uh, around, uh, you know, uh, a number of concepts and definitions and the, the limitations of the phenomenon. This is some, something that some of the questions I received from Professor Young illustrate uh, that. So in the, in the introductory part of the volume, we set out to try to uh, sketch out what we think are core principles of resilience from a 
a social science and organizational perspective. And we uh, we advance four, four principles or ideas. First is the idea that resilience lies at the interplay between stability and change, right? So um, uh, it's neither, resilience is neither pure stability nor uh, radical change, right? Uh, radical change is not resilience because you cannot no longer identify the previous essence or function, right? So there's a change in identity, right? So a university that over time became uh, like a for-profit organization, right? That is not resilient. That's 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 a radical change because it no longer uh, has the you know the undertones or what public organization is then geared towards, for example, uh, making money and providing sponsors, uh, funding sponsors, what uh, they wish to have in terms of product. Um, it's very different than saying what that private or private universities uh, or, you know perform that function. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying uh, it's some of the tensions that it, uh, universities are facing to stop bringing universities in the discussion. So resilience requires also some degree of adaptation. It's not mere survival, right? If an entity just survive over time, that's not resilient. That's uh, that, that's survival. Second aspect, uh, resilience uh, needs some adversity, right? So if you just uh, an entity, an organization, or individual goes smoothly without facing any challenges and survives, that's not resilient. Right. So to demonstrate resilience, an entity um, or a system needs to be able to overcome and adapt some type of adversity. Now, uh, some adversities are, uh, you know, what we consider low, medium, or, or high. Uh, you know, by adversity, here's the shocks. Some shocks are more uh, salient, um, and also related to the shocks is the degree of novelty of that shock. Right? Is the adversity known to actors, or is something totally novel? Right? So COVID-19, for example, was a case of high adversity because it disrupted our social, cultural, political, economic systems, but it had the medium uh, novelty. It wasn't high novelty because we have had coronavirus before and we have had pandemic before. Whether we learn how to deal with those, that's a different question, right? The third element is temporality. So we're seeing that resilience can occur before the adversity occurs, right? So that's what we call foresight or anticipatory uh, resilience during the mechanism, during the, the, the situation, right, that an entity is facing a challenge, that's the in situ, and the learnings that are done with that, and often the resilience after, the ex post uh, after. So there's a temporal dimension there, which also is important. And finally, that resilience occurs at different scales from the micro level of individual agents, uh, like professors or students, to the organizational level, like universities or states, to the system level, um, like institutions or society. And these uh, levels are often nested or integrated into another. So very quickly, why resilience? Why all these attention on resilience and why now? Well, uh, there's a growing um, policy interest uh, uh, on resilience and academic interest following the you know, multiple crises we have had in the last 15 to 20 years, right? Uh, some of you maybe are too young to remember, but 2008, the global financial crisis, which disrupted and started uh, questioning the idea of a, a globalized um, uh, economy and the notion of financialization of global economy, the power that uh, banks have, for example, right? And the little power that governments have uh, in Europe was manifested by 2009 Euro crisis, which almost, uh, you know, almost led to uh, a massive crisis within the union that was handled. We also have had, uh, here I'm giving some European examples, so I'm sorry for the non-Western audience, Brexit and migration crisis that we have had, uh, you know, which shed light on programs such as uh, EU integration, solidarity, uh, right-wing populism and democratic backsliding, right, that we have in the EU, countries like Hungary, uh, Poland, you know, attacking independent judiciaries and so on, the Trump phenomenon in the US, the Johnson or Brexit phenomenon in the UK, right, and so on. Uh, and more recently, you know, COVID-19 and uh, unfortunately the Ukraine war with this nested crisis that we see, right? COVID-19, we have the crisis of health, of economics and the social crisis. And the Ukraine war also elucidates that geopolitic conflicts have other repercussions such as the food and now an energy crisis, right? So all that led to a lot of interest by policymakers and academics. There's a second aspect, which is the inability of hegemonic theories and models. Uh, to really provide any meaningful answers. And here it's primarily the neoclassic economic model, which has been shaping neoliberal government policies in the last, um, you know, basically since the Reagan 
and, and, and the Thatcher era, right? So neoliberal policy is the market as a silver, silver bullet, as, as the solution to, for coordinating for all the menaces fading society. And what we see now is, uh, you know, a, a shift from focusing on gross domestic product to well-being and to sustainable inclusive growth, right? This is sort of the key words you see coming from the European Union, uh, but you see in other uh, countries as well. And a kind of a return of the state in a new role, right? And we have learned now also that when are these national crises, in fact, the state plays a more important role. And in fact, market players are not that meaningful uh, in this domain. So there's a number of uh, aspects here also related to the need to manage complexity in a highly turbulent environment and the need to address these weak problems, right? Problems for which there's no apparent solution and that require both systemic thinking, but also inter and pluri multidisciplinary approach. So academics have to work together because it's not solely a sociological problem. It's also a, a you know, governance problem. It's also an economic problem and so on. Very quickly before we move into higher education and to bring to establish this bridge. So uh, resilience in the public sector, what is the, the idea here? Well, for those of you who have studied public policy, public administration, in the last 30 or so years, there's been a movement from government to governance, right? So government as a single entity, running economies, uh, running all types of, uh, of social systems towards governance, which is a combination, a compilation of multiple actor, actors, social actors, including private organizations with competing interests and agendas, right? This is a big literature on polycentric and multi-level governance um, in political science and other domains. So the idea that also, uh, from internal hierarchies to external uh, networks, so that network model comes to the fore rather than uh, you know, the internal hierarchy as, a, as a, a, an efficient and perhaps more equitable way of, of orchestrating uh, social um, and addressing social issues. And also a concept which is this notion of reform as routine, which uh, Niels Brunson, a Swedish uh, scholar, as I lied a couple of years ago, right, that we now go into every single government that comes into the fore, you know, the first thing they do is that, you know, they announce a series of reforms. So reforms that become routine, which basically means the actors often don't even react because they wait for the next minister to do reforms. But it also means that we are into this issue cycle that uh, current reforms creates problems or unintended effects, which then creates the need for the next reform rounds to address those unintended effects, which then will create more unintended effects. And we go into this issue circle. Um, the second aspect is the public sector as a whole requires continuity of function while adapting, right? You cannot close an hospital. You cannot close a university and say, sorry, we are modernizing, right? They always say to my stu students here in Agder, see the public sector as this large ship that has to keep on sailing while it's being modernized and renovating, right? Uh, also in the past 20 years, we have seen that a lot of the new public management reforms injecting market dimensions into what is there, did not substitute the old um, bureaucracies, but he has basically creating what Helen Mahoney uh, call uh, layering systems. And these layering result into hybridization, which professors Johansson and Vakuri there in Tampere have written extensively about. These hybridizations create clashes amongst actors, amongst norms, amongst logics, and create a governance dilemma, which is that hybrid systems become rather difficult to steer, right? from a governance perspective. And the professor Yuja Chai will have a lecture I saw that will go into all these logic effect higher education dynamics. So let me now enter the second part of the lecture. Uh, maybe have a glass of water. Where then we move into higher education uh, as an example of the resilience. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I guess all of you, this history of these, these pictures familiar to most of you that almost every single day we open the newspapers and there is some news of a cutting in the department, uh, restructuration, a merger, a debates on universities not being responsive to society. So there is a kind of an environment, right? An external environment, which suggests there is a sense of crisis, whether it is real or fictitious, um, you know, it affects the dynamics. So if we take sort of very simplistic historical perspective going back to the 1990s, and again, taking Western Europe as a point of departure, we see, I already mentioned, the new public management reforms uh, very much uh, you know, around that idea of the market as, as the, the silver bullet, uh, emphasizing two things. First, efficiency, the higher education systems need to be efficient. So the higher number of outputs 
uh, given by the lower number of inputs, if there are economists in, in the room, and accountability, right? So transparency in terms of the decisions, uh, notions of quality and excellence should be uh, properly, um, uh, you know, available to uh, including the funders, the society. Um, in the 2000s, we see the rise of global competition, right? Competition is not new in higher education, but sort of structured global competition goes back to 20 plus years. Uh, competition for students, competition for talented staff, competition for funding, a competition for prestige. And I know that uh, my colleagues in, in, in China uh, very much face this type of environment as well. So it's a global competitive environment where now all universities are competing. It's no longer localized market where uh, other university would compete with Stavanger and so on. Uh, more recently, we also have had the phenomenon of digital transformation, right? Which amongst other things led to the rise of massive online, uh, open online courses like MOOC, uh, you know, concepts such as online campuses, blended learning and so on. And according to some, what's going to transform the world of higher education. So what were the sort of responsive mechanisms by managers and by policymakers around the well, the classic was performance management, uh, which I have documented with other colleagues here in the Nordic countries. So uh, basically measure uh, inputs. So in Norway, we measure everything. We measure how long a student stays in the system, how many credits a student produces, uh, how many publications uh, a particular department, a particular professor produces, and then there are incentive systems, right? Uh, even students here are incentivized to be efficient. So if they don't produce a certain amount of credit per year or per semester, a part of their grant from the Norwegian government is transferred into a loan, which they need to, to pay back, right? So it's a classic example of performance management. Also internal restructuring, uh, particularly from Denmark, is almost stories every week coming, uh, you know, departments being cut it because they are don't have enough uh, students. Uh, also in Norway, we have had so called forced mergers, right? Mergers between uh, institutions because of fragmentation, right? Very costly. Uh, BA and MA programs, for example, and more recently, the rise of strategic alliances, right? So the idea of collaborate or competing or what our business colleagues call competition. And then we get into the abstract part of understanding the university as an organization, as an institution. So again, uh, coming back to um, some of what Professor Chai said, those are models that have been primarily devised from Western perspective. But there are basically three ideal type models when we talk about university. Again, we talk about not a specific university, but the idea of a university. There's the traditional model, which is in the Northern European, North American context, uh, refers to the Humboldtian model of a university, 19th century. And you can read uh, something about it if you are not known about this model by the work of Niebaum and others. The dominant logic here of the traditional university is equality, is the idea of primus inter pares. We are all colleagues, there's no one more important. And, you know, uh, the professors basically run the show. The model of the parenti uh, is basically based on a social pact, pact of trust between higher education and society, brokered by the state, where the state left the institutions alone to do teaching and research, as long as the institutions would not be, you know, too involved. Um, and, and the key element of the traditional, the Humboldtian model is that teaching and research should be tightly intertwined. So professors should be teaching what they are uh, researching and so on. Uh, in terms of governance mechanism is a collegiality, right? As I mentioned, so it's basically amateur professors running department or what uh, Martin Olson called organized anarchy. No one really knows who is in charge. And the primary objective is to preserve academic autonomy, right? Through societal decoupling, meaning the, the university is some kind of a contemplated institution that looks at society, doesn't get too engaged or too close, or you know the danger of being biased or being so the disinterested aspect related to the ethos of science that Robert Merton described very eloquently. Um, but it shall give society what society uh, needs rather than what society necessarily wants. Uh, so that's very much the idea of autonomy. Uh, the entrepreneurial model, I guess everyone knows a bit this model focusing on efficiency. So this could also be called the NPM model, uh, rationalization. So we start taking away from amateur professors and we start rationalizing universities with professional administrators, right? A smaller group of individuals making decisions, more top down, more unified. Now we have a strategy, right? 20 years ago, few universities in the world have a strategy. Today, all universities have a strategy. All universities have a vision statement. And uh, studies from colleagues show that actually these strategies and statements are becoming uh, highly uh, equal from one another, right? So if the idea was to make it distinct, uh, so universities is part of these uh, isom isomorphic behavior are copying one another. 
But the primary objective is competition, is, is winning through global competition, right? What we are now arguing, and this is partly of our normative argument, is that we are now in a transition where primarily through this crisis and given the challenges and the systemic thinking brings this idea that there's an emergent model of university, which we call it post-entrepreneurial, could also be called the resilience model, which is all about adaptive behavior. And rather than being a model based on planning and steering and addressing uh, inefficiencies, is a, a model that cherishes complexity. So in a way, it goes back to the traditional model of university, fosters self-organization, tolerates lack, and uh, devises cultural failure. Right. So it allows because without failure, there's no experimentation. And in fact, uh, resilient systems celebrate the failure to a large extent. Um, internal governance is loosely coupled systems, so autonomous entities, but align. Uh, but aligned with one another. So it isn't that you create isolated pockets within universities, but there is an agreement on what the primary objectives are, where the university and what the core functions are, and then allow the different uh, subunits, the different faculties, different departments, different research groups, different academics, uh, you know, to address that as they see fit. And the primary objective is thriving, thriving in a, in a broad ecosystem through requisite variety that different institutions um, uh, like, you know, seeing in the natural ecosystem, different types of fauna and flora will provide benefit to the system as a whole. Uh, I myself earlier uh, worked on trying to unpack a little bit in university complexity, and I came up with this model of the five ambiguities uh, where uh, I state and other colleagues, we have tested these out uh, in terms of the institutionalization of the third mission, for example, ambiguity of history, which is what's all, you know, most universities are quite old institutions, and there are issues of path dependencies, right? Which makes them that they also are both resilient, but also resistance to change, right? Uh, there is this saying that uh, there are two entities that are difficult to move geographically. They are the cemeteries and universities. Once established, they are very difficult to move geographically. Uh, ambiguity of intention, which is related to the goals and priorities. Uh, there is this caricature that say, if you ask three professors, what the meaning of university is all about, you will get four answers, right? So actors do not really, uh, you know, share, uh, you know, uh, uh, the common views on what the university is about, or at least many authors, actors. And because you understand, relate to these, uh, you know, we know there are students coming in and there are graduates coming out, there's research funding coming in, there are projects coming out for publications, but in many respects, there's still a black box inside, right? We are still, our pedagogical colleagues are still wondering what is the best way uh, of learning, right? Uh, there's a number of questions as well. What makes successful research projects, for example, in research teams? Uh, th that's still a, a black box. There's a lot of ambiguity and what worked in one context might not work in another. Ambiguity of structure, which I shed light upon about the, the coupling of the leadership structures and so on. And the ambiguity of meaning, which is related to the cultural complexity of the university as an organization, as an institution, right? Uh, not only a specific universities like Peking have local cultures, but also they have very specific professional cultures, right? There are administrators, there are academics, there are students, and there are a lot of clashes and with these cultures, and not least there are disciplinary cultures, right? Uh, which uh, Tony Beecher and others have written very eloquently around the ocean of tribes and territory. So um, have universities really adapted over time? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, um, here's an illustration uh, by, uh, uh, you know, adapted from the work of a colleague who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, a uh, prominent figure in regional science studies, Paul Bennerworth. And me and Paul devised a, a you know, a template and uh, did a number of publications. And, and, and basically Paul created this schematic, which I think provides a very good, interesting idea of the historical evolution, right? So on the left, you have the social change driver, what is happening in society, right? Uh, on the middle, you have the types of tasks that are expected of universities to take. And then towards the right of your screen, you have the idea or ideal of university, right? So for example, during the times of agricultural revolution, right? The primary task was universities uh, or at least the ancient uh, or, or countries were distributed to produce religious administrators, right? And the model was the 11th century Italian model of the cloister, right? Where the academics were isolated and basically were studying, uh, you know, the and, and, and sort of memorizing. If we move to, for example, urbanization, then the primary mandate for universities is to educate administrative elites to manage trade, right? And one example here of such a template 
is the Catholic University of Logan uh, going back to the 15th century. Nation building, here comes Humboldt, right? The idea of creating a technical elite alongside administrative elite to create strong nation states, right? And a strong sense of national identity. Uh, and more recently, globalization, right? The idea that universities through students, through research, through knowledge, provide societies with the mechanisms for economic growth, job creation, innovation, and competitiveness at a global scale. And this is then embodied into an ideal or ideal of university, uh, you know, that everyone has to become like Stanford or MIT, right? The, the, the entrepreneurial model. So now the little time I have left, the 10 minutes, I want to show some preliminary work we are doing uh, together with my colleague, uh, Mitchell Young and Alexander Avramovich uh, here in Agder. And he's currently in under peer review. So I'm not, I'm not able to show the latest uh, data, but I'll give you an insight on the first data set. So very quickly on the study, we looked at two flagship comprehensive research universities in Nordic countries, University of Copenhagen, University of Oslo. We took a time frame of 20 years and we took the Nordic context because it represents a case of external turbulence where um, both Norway and Denmark have been the target of um, NPM-inspired reforms associated with this idea of entrepreneurial turn in um, Nordic education. We also build and extend the seminal work by Frank and Gabler, a book they wrote at Stanford, where they actually uh, analyze how the academic core, so degree programs, uh, and how they are structured as faculties uh, across the world uh, over a 100-year period, a massive, massive undertaking, which really inspired us. So we are basically want to do the follow-up of what they did for the first part of the 21st century. So by academic core, we talk about bachelor and master's degree programs, which we considered uh, to be the foundation of degree structures in, in, most, uh, in most studies. We look at, in, in most countries, we look at three data points, 2003, 2009, 2019, and see uh, the types of studies, the nature of studies, uh, programs, and so on. Uh, we look at, you know, so we, we take official figures, uh, university websites, and also we use a very uh, interesting tool that might be very relevant for some students here, which is called Wayback Machine, which basically you can see a website as it was, say, 20 years ago, right? So you can go to the University of Oslo Faculty of Humanities website in uh, 2003 and, and read uh, the faculties, the programs that they have to a large extent. So it's a great tool. Then we coded both by brands, the three branches that Frank and Gabler use, natural sciences, humanities, and social sciences, and by type of program, where it was applied program, basic program, or interdisciplinary. We also looked at student and faculty numbers, um, although from only 2007. The analysis is not very sophisticated, so we don't use any uh, sophisticated uh, statistics. It's descriptive analysis uh, so far. Here's a quick snapshot, just all the cases. So Copenhagen being older than Oslo, uh, you know, in Nordic context, those are large institutions. I know from a Chinese context, those are small institutions in terms of the number of students, uh, 39,000 in Copenhagen, 28,000 in Oslo. Uh, Copenhagen had a merger with two other institutions, uh, veterinary and agricultural science and pharmacy in 2007, which of course affected uh, both its profile and its size. But there you see the number of faculty in terms of the Student, uh, student staff ratio or student faculty ratio, Copenhagen has much higher. So 78, 7.8 students per staff, whereas Oslo has 4.2 students per academic staff. Um, similar faculty profiles, Oslo has two other faculties, but you can see both with this, uh, the old uh, uh, faculties of uh, law, medicine, and theology, for example. And then some information on the rankings, which we tried to operationalize earlier, and that's not doing, but it gives you an insight. Copenhagen is slightly ahead depending on how you measure it. I'm sure some of you know how complicated these rankings are and how contested, uh, you know, uh, but basically, so Copenhagen ranks slightly higher, both the first ranking is the, I think the, the Chinese Yontown ranking, if I'm pronouncing correctly, uh, which puts more emphasis on research, productivity, and the second one is the Times Higher Education, which is more emphasis on internationalization. Anyway, so they are not world leading, but they are regional leading institutions. So what, do, what does our analysis do? And uh, apologies for my very crude uh, drawings. Uh, I tried to sort of shed your light of attention. So if we look at first the picture on the right, then we have the number of programs. Uh, UO is Oslo, so it has an O in the end. And UOC is Copenhagen with a C in the end. 
we see that in the blue bar, there's been a growing number of programs over the 20 year period. But then we look at the other color bars and we see that the growth has not been homogeneous across the field, right? So there's been more growth in the natural sciences uh, across both institutions, some stability uh, in the other fields, and particularly a big growth in the natural sciences in, uh, in Copenhagen in the first period. So between 2003 and 2009, the T1 there that you can see with the ball is the point for which the curves intersect. So at that point, the humanity, say the natural sciences, becomes the dominant, uh, the dominant, uh, say faculty, the dominant field, surpassing in the case of Copenhagen and um, in both Copenhagen and also the, the humanities. If we look at then the program offerings, that gives you a slightly different picture. It's basically the same, but it, 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 you know, it, it, it's easier for us to see the different nuances, again, picking up the first 2003 and 2019. And we see a, a big growth, again, in the natural science in both institutions, but almost a double in Copenhagen, and also a growth in something we don't see in the first graph, which is interdisciplinary programs, right? Uh, so programs that bring more than one discipline. Later on, we end up in the paper, we are articulating this in interbranch because we think interbranch is a, a, a better measure than inter so interdisciplinary could be, for example, sociology and political science, right? There are two disciplines, but they are still within the social sciences. So you could argue that they haven't really passed the disciplinary threshold. Interbranch means when then say a program in the social sciences reaches out to a program in the humanity. Then it's between one of these three branches that I mentioned earlier, right? There are there, humanity, social science, and natural science, which in our view represents the case of um, uh, transformative resilience because they are reaching out there in a way pushing the threshold or what would otherwise be allowed within that discipline. This table is perhaps the most interesting one to show which uh, the volatility means the programs that were continued over time, the programs that were, so those are in blue, the programs that were discontinued in orange and the new programs that came to the fore, right? And we see a number of things. So we see quite, quite, you know, quite a lot of stability in humanities, right? despite the fact that Frank and Gabler, for example, their analysis and other commentators show that the humanities are in decline and we see some evidence of that. But then when we look at the programs, in fact, in fact actually the humanities seem to be relatively resilient in terms of being able to withstand um, their profile. Um, then we also see, uh, if we look at the, the Copenhagen to the right, we see there the, green, the gray area basically represents innovation, right? So we see that uh, the natural sciences and interdisciplinary programs have really increased, you know, the number of new programs. Now we still are doing that's for the next phase, doing the analysis of to what extent, what is the level of novelty of these programs? We haven't done that. We haven't done the first step in mapping and documenting, and now we need to probe into those those programs. But nevertheless, this could be uh, a, a, a first indication of transformative resilience. And the natural sciences there, going back to Oslo, to the left. Uh, the blue, the bar indicating. Um, so continuity, again, uh, in the natural sciences also represents a, a case of absorptive resilience, right? So the ability to withstand all these changes and, and continue, uh, you know, so your old programs remain unchanged. Um, if, if we look at it in terms of types of program, in terms of applied, basic, and interdisciplinary, the picture is, again, similar. We see a decline of basic programs across the board, quite a strong decline at Copenhagen in the second part of the period. Uh, and we see an increase in interdisciplinary programs almost at the same time. That's also interesting in both institutions. Around 2009, that seems to be sort of what political scientists call the critical juncture there. Now it's important to put the caveat there in the blue bar in terms of the applied programs that there's, this could be part of the merger effect, right? That I told you earlier in 2007, there were two institutions that merged with Copenhagen and they brought more applied programs. There were veterinary, uh, pharmaceutical sciences, agriculture, those are applied programs. So it could be, that's not a natural growth, right? Um, also didn't have any, uh, any merger. So we need to control for that. And we'll do that later on. Then we also look at what extent the core, what's happening in the academic core mirrors, right? What's happening with the staff and students. So here are the, the you know, changes in terms of the academic staff, right? So they all grew. And again, uh, Copenhagen to the right grew much more quickly, right? Around 2000, up to 2015, and then it slowed down. Uh, whereas in Oslo, it's been more of a gradual growth. And we see also that, you know, for the most part, um, sorry, the, the growth in the natural sciences and the humanities 
and the social sciences remained uh, relatively stable, which is in, in, interesting in itself. Moving in the types of programs, uh, again, the picture to the top uh, suggests once again that uh, if you look at Oslo, right, in the beginning of the period, we start with the dominance of programs in the humanities at the BA level and end up the period very much matched where the natural sciences have now catched up with the humanities, a slight decline in the social sciences, and then a period there where the natural science surpassed the social sciences around 2010. In the case of Copenhagen, it's interesting, in the beginning of the period, humanities dominate, and then at the end of the period, we see the two, uh, in, the two lines inverting. So then the natural sciences are on top, not the humanities, and the threshold point there when the curve when the natural science become more dominant or the dominant, uh, the dominant field is around 2010. Also very much similar to University of Oslo. So there's some interesting, intriguing timings here. Uh, and we see the similar picture for uh, master level students as well, right? The points of intersection there, uh, uh, natural sciences around 2010 becoming the second, uh, so it starts the period having in a way the, low, the, the, the lowest field in terms of degree programs and the period, the period in 2018 um, with with a for this students with a higher number of of enrollment, again the, with the caveat that we don't have data for 2003. Now, one interesting thing to note here is that we also identified theology as a very interesting case study, which we want to analyze in the future paper. So, what we see in both institutions that theology as a field, as a subfield of humanity, survives despite very small numbers. So, 580 students at in Copenhagen and 355 in Oslo, right? This is very, very low when you think about, uh, you know, the, the, the total enrollment. So it's about 1% of total enrollment, but they still have a faculty, right? So how can we explain that, right? So our preliminary explanation is that this is related to path dependencies and institutionalization, right? So the classic university, the identity of a classic institution or the medieval university, you have to have these three uh, fields, the professional fields of law, medicine, and theology. And this gives you the legitimacy despite the secularization of societies and the low demand for, for this course, that there's still a faculty of theology at both institutions. So uh, what's the synthesis when it, when it comes to the academic core findings? And I know I'm likely running out of time, so uh, I'll try to be quick. When it comes to program offerings, so we see a trend towards increasing in the natural sciences, as predicted by Frank and Gabler uh, earlier, uh, an increase in the applied and interdisciplinary programs. So, Perhaps denoting again this uh, this pressure that universities are facing uh, for social impact, right? For relevancy, for you know, providing graduates and programs that address the needs of societies, including these weak problems that I mentioned earlier. But we see also stable patterns in the humanities and social sciences, right? And decline in the basic program. So the humanities, which have been attacked, uh, according to some, right? And uh, we hear almost discourses every day, are able at least at these. Uh, comprehensive institutions to hold their ground, right? Despite uh, certain adversity. Uh, the same student and faculty numbers, which we see as, uh, so these, these represent resources, right? If you don't have most funding systems in the Nordic countries are based on, on student numbers. So, uh, and of course, in most, the, most expenses are related to faculty. So this is where, uh, again, increase in natural sciences, decrease in the other branches. When it comes to resilience, this is still very tentative and we are revising a little bit the analysis in accordance to the uh, reviews that we have received, but we see that the natural sciences in Oslo uh, seem to represent a case of absorptive resilience. So they have been able to withstand a lot of continuity uh, despite you know, the growth on enrollment and perhaps this growing enrollment legitimizes for them not to have to adapt. Uh, the social science and humanities in Copenhagen um, seem to represent cases of adaptive resilience or what Salon Mahoney called layering, where old offerings uh, uh, emerge alongside new programs. Uh, or what James March would say, a combination of exploitation and exploration strategy, right? You do more of what you do already, plus you innovate. And finally, uh, there is some suggestion of transformative resilience within the social sciences in Oslo and the natural sciences and interdisciplinary programs at, in Copenhagen. So um, two quick slides on conclusive thoughts. So conclusive thoughts uh, uh, based on the, you know, uh, the first conclusive thought that I have is in my view and in the colleagues working these systems and resilience thinking provides a useful analytical lens to unpack the complexities facing different types of social systems, including organizations, uh, public sector organizations, which are operating in increasingly turbulent conditions. 
And I forgot to mention that turbulence, as it is advocated in the literature by Trondahl and others, has both an internal and or endogenous and exogenous component, right? So universities have internal turbulence because of that structural and cultural complexity that I mentioned to you earlier. But there's also external turbulence, which is all the environment that is changing, right? And putting new pressures and new demands. Second, we make an argument also built on earlier papers that universities have inbuilt resilient features, right? It has loose coupling. But that these features have been the target of recent modernization reforms aimed and centered on efficiency of function, which if you recall, is the engineering view of resilience, right? Design universities as Formula One cars to run fast. But the problem is that when they face adversity, right? When you are in the desert, is the Formula One car the best mechanism or should you maybe have also one or two jeeps, right? As part of your slack, because suddenly you need to cross the desert and the Formula One car, you know, cannot run. So this idea of moving from efficiency of function, which is a primarily goal of modernizers and rationalizers, right? And managers towards maintenance of function under adversity, right? Uh, and, and, and our argument is that, you know, this efficiency of function may affect in the long term the ability of universities uh, you know, to adapt to new circumstances. So we're going back to this idea of the global value chains, right? We are designing universities for efficiency, and then suddenly there's going to be disruption in the system, and then, you know, there will be a disruption in the function. And we should think about this maintenance of function. Efficiency is important, but there should be limits and thresholds to efficiency. And lastly, that the change in academic core, in our view, provide critical insights on the degree of adaptation at the macro level. And that the same when we talk about entrepreneurial universities earlier, we talk about resilience universities, it's very difficult to characterize complex ambidextrous organizations such as universities. So we need to go down to the level of action, right? The subunit level, the task, the programs, the staff, if you want to say something about resilience. And it could very well be that there are parts. So our argument is that it's not necessarily Oslo as an institution that is resilient, but there are programs, there are disciplines within all Oslo that may demonstrate resilience. And in the whole, all things being equal, contribute to resilience building at the University of Oslo as a whole, right? So again, micro level uh, analysis. And, and finally, a short epilogue, and I know I'm taking time from the question, so apologies in advance. Uh, what does this mean in terms of governance and managerial view? So if I have any people um, in the audience that is interested, you know, you know, so we, it means that we need to embrace, move away from an efficient uh, centered uh, governance model, public management model towards embracing, um, you know, what uh, Taleb and other colleagues talk about anti-fragile or adaptive systems. We need to develop systems for anti-fragility. We need to embrace complexity and randomness, right? Because things happen that we don't know that are going to happen. We need to tolerate failures. We need to build repositories of Slack. If that means having two groups doing research in the humanities, so great. Maybe they will come with different ideas and make humanities at a particular system or university more resilient as a field. Um, and moving away from seeing adversity as something negative to seeing adversity as a strength. So when organizations face adversity, basically it's a, a testing ground for managers and leaders to learn, right? How resilient their institutions are. So this notion of dynamic resilience and bouncing forward. So is a should be seen as a glass half full rather than half empty. Foster collective learning, as I mentioned earlier, balance what you do already well, but also explore, right? Uh, you know, invest in research groups that are emergent. And the tendency we see, for example, in policy, at least in Europe, is that the money is going to the already good research groups. And that's creating the concentration and to what um, Merton and other colleagues talk about, the Matthew effects of science. The rich get richer, right? And the rest of the faculty struggle with having to do a lot of, of, of studies, right? And that's not sustainable, I think, from a systemic perspective. Um, and finally, uh, leaders as key agents in nurturing trust. So um, resilience is an emergent property. So it cannot be managed. It cannot be steer top down, but there are things managers can do to create conditions for resilience to emerge, right? As I mentioned earlier, create a, call, a culture of tolerance of failure, experimentation, uh, novel ideas, collective learning, adaptive mental models, and so on. Uh, and not least also, you know, uh, leading by example. So that being said, thank you for your attention. I hope that my Chinese using Google Scholar is not too crappy and that I'm not insulting anyone online.
Uh, thank you, Ron Rolf, for this very interesting and comprehensive uh, introduction to the resilience theory, also the applications in the higher education sector, particularly at the very end, you give a very, uh, I think, very um, novel exploration based on resilience theory to explore the changes in the University of Oslo and the University of Copenhagen. I think there's a, you provide a lot of uh, food for thought including not only the theoretical review or the overview of the theoretical part, but also the implications for education research. And I think your uh, empirical research demonstrate the potentials of applying all this kind of theoretical thinking to analyze the current situation we were facing, especially I think very interesting, uh, at least for us uh, from China to understanding the, 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 the rising of the interdisciplinary research in research universities in recent years. Uh, I think both the um, both the orientation of uh, theoretical orientation and also the empirical implications are uh, uh, of uh, uh, great values. So thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Also thank you for giving so much information in such a short time period. So now we uh, open our floor for questions and answers. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to write down in the chat box or raise your hand after the the the, um, the lecture. Uh, and then we'll invite you to to open uh, to to open your camera and raise your question. Uh, any questions, please? Yes. Uh, yes, please. Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Svetlana Shendrova. I'm a uh, the affiliated researcher at Tampere University, currently based in Russia. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to say my thank you for the uh, very interesting event and to the organizers and for extremely interesting presentation by Professor Pineda. Uh, it is extremely interesting and valuable both for higher education researchers and for higher education practitioners. And as a former head of an academic policy department at uh, the rector's office of St. Petersburg State University, uh, I have a very strong impression on your analysis of interdisciplinary uh, interplay during the reform. So um, I have uh, some questions in relation to your practical uh, part and to your historical part. So my first question is, we are uh, uh, engineering and hard sciences. Did you include them into it? Because you know that each classification is very flexible, uh, is very argued. And so uh, we are uh, engineering and hard sciences in your uh, divisions of, uh, in your disciplinary divisions. Uh, the other question is related to interplay between the university resilience and employability of graduates. For example, you showed that the number of full-time students and the, the degree programs increased for natural sciences. So you consider it as a, an extent of success of the reforms. But on the other hand, students go to the university not to uh, increase its resilience, but to find the job after uh, graduation. So uh, did you compare the level of employability of these uh, newly uh, enrolled students, the students who were enrolled for this uh, new open, new, new, new degree programs? And my third question is related to the historical part. I like your slide 13 with the evolution of the type of universities from the Bologna times till now. It's very fruitful and I see it's very insightful for further research. 
And what I see there, that there is no place for Russian higher education system. Because uh, Russian high, uh, uh, and this is directly related to the point which you highlighted uh, at the beginning of your presentation, this Western and non-Western uh, approach. Uh, so uh, could you um, explain uh, where are the places for the other non-Western types of universities or non-Western higher education systems which developed in the other historical uh, conditions. Thank you very much. Yeah, shall I address uh, Professor Young or shall we wait more questions? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, maybe, uh, yes. Uh, maybe you can address this question first. Yes, one with okay, well, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Good to see you again online. Uh, it's been a while. Good questions indeed. So start with the first one on 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 the on the practical aspects and engineering. So we we did include engineering in the hard sciences, part of the natural sciences, right? Uh, but we haven't made a separate analysis in terms of differentiating, for example, uh, certain fields within the uh, and the dominance tended to be around the classic uh, hard sciences, right? Chemistry, physics, and so on. Uh, on the second question on the employability, that's an excellent question, and we haven't done an analysis, right? Of uh, that will be a, a different topic, I think. You are absolutely right. Uh, students don't choose universities or fields with the idea of enhancing the resilience of, uh, you know, uh, they couldn't care less, right? And why should they? Um, that's not necessarily a critique. Uh, but we also know that in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, there's been an hege hegemonic discourse from the World Bank, OECD, around the so-called STEM fields, right? Science, technology, engineers, and maths. And that could be part of the reason why we see an increase in the natural sciences, right? Um, particularly in these flagship institutions. It's also important to give the caveat that those are two old research-intensive universities, right? Uh, where at least some of the traditional fields, but we thought also that in, you know the, the traditional universities are the ones where it's perhaps the most interesting to study for resilience because uh, a lot of actors, because of the institutionalized dimensions of cultures and and resources, and are quite um, quite resistant towards change, right? But we see uh, both change and stability happening, uh, but that definitely employability will be, um, and we do know that uh, at least. Um, you know, that's the argument that many have advocated around the humanities, right? That many people cannot find jobs anyway. So why are universities, you know, but we see, still see nevertheless these, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the decoupling between supply and demand, right? That independently of the labor market requirements, students want to study humanities or social sciences and they, they go on and do it, right? And in the Nordic countries, the social sciences was really what uh, the field that led to the growth in the last 15 to 20 years. On the historical part, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have an answer. This is really a question for the non-Western colleagues. So I'm just saying that a similar type of analysis, right? I know that the Western models, uh, whether because of colonialism or because of the global, you know, global ideas, have had an influence in non-Western settings uh, for the good and for the bad. And there are features of these models, right? Uh, in, in, it can be traced in many, many non-Western systems. Uh, but this is why I think uh, Professor Kai and Professor Young, and we're also uh, doing another work on uh, sustainability, that is important to bring to this discussion non-Western scholars, right? Uh, unfortunately, the, the scholarship historically has been quite thin, but we see now, for example, uh, at the latest chair conference, uh, you know, the rise of a lot of young scholars from Asia. Uh, and particularly China, right? So that should be, uh, and hopefully from other places as well, including Russia. So that should be, uh, you know, um, that should be cause for optimism, right? But basically the core message, and I think Professor Chai would agree here, is do not take these models for granted. They are models that are, you know, uh, historically embedded into a Western context, which have relevancy maybe to approach because there are aspects of the models in teaching and research which transcend a national context, but there are important variations in terms of the governance 
and, and the norms and values which are important to, to tackle. And they may, may, may also you know, uh, play a role when it comes to unpacking resilience. I see we have other questions, so I'll try to keep it short. Does anyone want to read maybe from the chat? I don't know which ones to prioritize. Uh, yeah, thank you okay. again, Svetlana. Yeah, the first one, actually, I just typed the first question. Oh. Uh, how to define <laughs> threshold? Yeah, if the threshold change during the co-evolution of the system and the environment, uh, how to define threshold, is, especially when the threshold, uh, you know, separate uh, adapt, adaption and trans, uh, transformability. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. So this is a very complex question, which even uh, system scholars, right, are grappling with. I'm, I'm, I'm a relatively novice, right, when in, in terms of using these uh, compared to people I've been working in the field, and there are still these discussions about the, even uh, different takes on resilience, right? Depending on your perspective, I give you, I gave you two, right, on the the classic more of natural sciences and the one more of the system view, but there are still major disagreements. Um, now. The way we define it in our work, right, both on in the book and here in the journal, in sorry, in the paper soon to be published, hopefully, um, is uh, threshold is you know refers to these limits of el el elasticity, right? So if we bring universities to the discussion, right, universities are being pressurized to, amongst other things, deliver um, you know to be closer to the economy, for example, right? And I would say there is a limit there for which, as I mentioned. If universities, uh, you know, if all we do is applied research, if all we do is external generated projects, right? If all we do is training for industry, then at one point, if university passes the threshold for which uh, it is no longer a public good type of institution, right? And it becomes, um, you know, sort of a consultancy company of a research tank. I know there's a lot of frustration, right, with actors also here in, in Agder saying, well, you know, but universities are very bad at innovation and entrepreneurship. They have never been designed to do so, right? Universities are primarily institutions to, you know, discuss and create ideas and, you know, and to socialize the future generations and provide skills and competences and so on. But this is a new role that they have to take on board, right? One of the many uh, revolutions that that Skowish and other colleagues have have, um, have pointed out. Uh, so coming back to your question, you know, um, it is the threshold. So because of this idea of system dynamic, the threshold is not static, right? The threshold moves away, and that in a way determines the the you know and contract as well, right? The the you know the the you know the the, the limits of uh, what what we are arguing is that these uh, this concept of a threshold in its simplistic form can be quite important for both managers and policymakers and scholars alike in our field to try to understand the limits of change and the limits of adaptation, right? And move to a point where rather than advancing a critique and saying, well, universities are not responding uh, to, you know, more imperatives for innovation and economic growth. And as a result, our ivory towers, as is often in the caricature, right? And suggest, okay, but if they do so, they might cross that threshold and what are the possible and intended consequences, right? for students, for staff, and for the institutional integrity of the university, right? I know I'm biased together with other colleagues in terms of, you know, trying to defend, we are institutionalists, right? To defend the integrity and the autonomy of, of, of institutions. And we are explicit about it, but um, we know from other systems, right? And Burton Clark in his classic writings um, gives some interesting examples about if an institution becomes too much what the outside wants it to be, this is what Philip Zelznik, one of the fathers of the old institution, called. He becomes co-opted by external interests, right? And if he becomes co-opted, it no longer has an identity. It no longer knows what it stands for, right? And I think if the university reached to that stage, then there's be a series of um, negative feedback mechanisms, right? Because then the students will get confused as well. Uh, you know, if academics don't know what the you know the, the you know the, the what, what the purpose of knowledge production, knowledge, uh, knowledge transmission is. Uh, so I'm not sure I addressed entirely your question, but it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, and, and, I, and I would say as well that this idea of field discussions, right, organization of field. Uh, so we, we can, this threshold is not static, number one, and different thresholds operate within different systems, right? So this is where you need to go back to the system level analysis and say, okay, within the Chinese higher education system, right? What is the threshold? 
uh, you know, or the boundaries within which universities have that flexibility, that elasticity to navigate from being, say, um, in, you know, independent public good institutions towards becoming, you know, uh, instruments for, for policy, for example. Thank you very much. I think that uh, makes a lot of sense, especially regarding different systems may have different thresholds and particularly in your cultural or environmental uh, background. So I think the next question from Professor Yan Fengqiao. So uh, Professor Yan, would you like to open your camera and uh, uh, raise your question? Professor, thank you very much for your insightful lecture. Uh, my question uh, concern the efficiency on the one hand and uh, adaptability on the other hand you mentioned in, in your conclusion. Uh, my question is concerns uh, the two systems. One system is a uh, uh, tightly controlled system, and uh, uh, the second one is a loosely coupled uh, system like university. Yeah. Can you compare uh, two systems, the rationale uh, between efficiency and uh, adapt, uh, adaptability? Yeah. Thank you. Excellent question, Professor Feng Xiao. Uh, very relevant indeed, and I'll, I'll try as much as possible to address. Uh, I think it's something, uh, this, in, this could be a, a very interesting topic uh, to write a paper or even a, a volume. So uh, maybe some of the students take that challenge, but I'll try in this uh, limited time of time. So I think one, one aspect that is important here, and thank you for raising that question, is of temporality, right? And there's been a lot of discussion now, also in the post-COVID environment around, you know, is crisis management resilience, for example, right? So crisis management is adaptability within the short term, right? I'm very much focusing on this idea of bouncing back to, to the normal, right? Uh, going back to, so a, a, adapt in the short term, so then we, we can go back to the, our efficient system, right? Uh, hospitals being able to accommodate all types of patients and so on. Uh, resilience, it's not about that. Resilience is about the long-term adaptability, right? So what is e efficient in the short term, which is often in the crisis management mode, might not necessarily be efficient in the long term, right? Uh, and this brings me to the issue of the loose and tight coupling, right? So if you have a short-term temporal perspective in the context of crisis management, as COVID-19, to illustrate with an example we all know very well, then you need a relatively tightly coupled system. Because as we have learned, if say different regions or different arms of the government, you know, address COVID-19 differently or uh, localize the rule, right? One uses masks, the other one doesn't do masks. One uses vaccination, the other one postpones vaccinations. Then it's gonna, from a short-term uh, adaptability perspective, and in terms of coming back to the idea of an efficient system, it's counterproductive, right? So you need, uh, you know, this is sort of a crisis management scholars, you need centralization, you need tighter coupling, right, to ensure. But in the long run, right, that can become counterproductive precisely because of this idea. So loosely coupled systems, uh, you know, like universities and other professional bureaucracies like hospitals, where the agents uh, are quite autonomous, right? Um, loose coupling can be advantageous, right? Because the efficiency we are referring to, it's not, um, yeah, hi, now I can see you. It's not going back to that holding distinction between efficiency of function versus um, maintenance of function, right? So an efficiency within a resilience, loosely coupled regime, it's not necessarily associated with giving you, say, the higher number of students, right, per uh, funding, by governmental funding, or the higher number of publications per academic staff, right? But it's more raising the question about whether the system is, um, given the adversity that faces over time, is able to maintain its function. So under conditions of COVID-19, financial crisis, geopolitical crisis, right? Then we move from this efficiency of function, which then focusing on more loose coupling and the short termism towards the maintenance of function, right? And then says, okay, the important thing is that our students keep on learning even if they have to do it online, which we know is suboptimal, but it's better than nothing, right? So, um, yeah. 
that's I, I know most probably I didn't address entirely. Your question is 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 an excellent one. And and as I say, we deserve a really interesting, but this interplay between efficiency, adaptability, and degree of coupling is uh, is extremely uh, important. Just give you a short example to terminate, for example, from uh, ecological systems where this literature is more advanced than in, 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 in public sector organizations. For example, research on uh, how the coral reefs are responding to uh, global warming, right? To a rise in the temperature of water suggests that the most resilient parts of the coral reef are those they are more loosely coupled, right? So elements of the reef are not dependent. So you can have bleaching on one part of the reef and that bleaching does not contaminate the other part of the reef. But also there is a, a link to another element you haven't put in your question, you didn't need to, but I want to introduce with this idea of um, uh, what comes from cybernetics, Ashley concept of the prerequisite diversity. The more diversity a, a system has, the more a system has the ability right, to self-organize, that links to loose coupling, right? And to provide an efficient response, efficient again from the perspective of the maintenance of function in the face of adversity, right? So areas of the reef that have more diversity in terms of fauna and flora, right? Different types of fishes, different types of, of, of coral reef plants and so on, will provide different responses to a warming of the temperature and research shows are more likely to uh, at least in the short term mitigate the negative effect uh, of, of 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 global warming when compared to areas of the reef of the of the, of the reef that are more tightly coupled and have lower uh, diversity or lower levels of diversity. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for both questions and wonderful uh, responses. Next uh, is uh, Qin Zhuoli. Uh, Professor or oh, Dr. Chin Zhuoli, please uh, address your question. Can you open your camera and uh, address your question, please? Mm, uh, hello, everyone. I'm a yeah. student uh, learning. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'm a student learning about hair education right now, and uh, now I'm in India. That's why I'm, I raised mm. a question about India. So here in India, there are lots of private institutions that with very limited institutional resources and capacities. So many of them are mainly just offering one disciplinary study, such as MBA study or engineering study. Uh, what do you see the future of uh, this kind of uh, uh, institutions? Do they think they will Oh, disappear in more competitive in environment or will they stay if they can stay what would you suggest to them to be more resilient mm. thank you very much for your question very interesting question and uh, good that you are in india learning about other systems that's very important so the first thing i want to say like most social scientists we don't do futurology so i don't know <laughs> what the future will be like what i would say from a resilience perspective is number one there's nothing wrong in specializing right but the danger of specialization, right? These smaller institutions in systems like India, Brazil, uh, in, in, you know, in, in Europe, we have had Poland as a classic, I think, I believe also in Russia, right, Petlana? There's a number of private providers. So, no, okay. So they need to, they need to cater to specific uh, groups because those groups are the ones that often are not being catered by the dominant public sector or dominant institutions, right? So, so it's a question of niche marketing. So it makes sense from a strategic management perspective. From a resilience perspective is different because it goes back to the idea of the, the stock market, right? If you ask to any, uh, any person that uh, invests money for other people, right? In the stock market, they say, the number one rule is don't invest your money in the same company, diversify, right? So the danger that these uh, mono faculty, mono degree institutions have is that they are so specialized. Like with that animal out there, in the savanna, right? There are certain insects, they are specialized. They get pollen, they have developed, uh, right? A peak to pick up pollen from particular plants. If that plant, you know, goes bust because of climate change or, or deforestation, the animal goes bust, right? So that is the problem with over-specialization. So an advice here to these leaders would be, um, you know, Great, continue doing your MBAs and your programs. That's that's your cash cow in strategic management. 
the language. This is where we generate the money and, and, and you said, oh, prestige. But over the long run, try to diversify, right? So balance exploitation of existing and exploration. Now, it's very difficult for, for many of these private providers, right? They don't have the competence or the resources to branch out in other fields. But here they can, for example, develop alliances or collaborations with other uh, institutions, right? And perhaps bring, and what I would say is that maybe this transition to what we seem to be identifying that there is this turn towards the, both the interdisciplinarity and the interbranch, right? May create opportunities, right? For fields that are willing to branch out or to bridge with others. So um, maybe for, uh, you know, business schools or private institutions that are thinking in branching out, I would say maybe the environment has never been better, right? Um, from a historical perspective, to reach out to, you know, and, and develop, you know, uh, build, uh, you know, bringing in a humanity component to business studies, for example, right? Or a climate change component to business studies and reach out to the natural sciences and, and, and their counterpart in the natural science and humanities in more established universities may actually be open to do that because of these changing environments, right? That I mentioned earlier. So there are opportunities there, but again, I know in pragmatic terms, it might be difficult and these managers need to think about their bottom line and deliver. But it goes back again to, they need to move away from efficiency of function and making money out of a few degrees like the MBA and thinking about maintenance of function. If uh, tomorrow there's no MBA students, how can we survive? How can we diversify to become less dependent on one type of program, one type of student? Hope I answered your question. Good question again. Then we have Lan Li. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Lila, would you like to open your camera and uh, raise your question, please? It's very nice to see faces. So I know that maybe some of you prefer to write, but it's great to have it both <laughs> a preview of your question. Is, is uh, Dr. Lee still with us? Uh, yes, I think she's coming. <laughs> okay, yeah. I can maybe start addressing what is the outcome of resilience? Oof. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's a, you know, uh, what is the outcome of resilience? Well, the, the, the way I see it and the way we, we approach the topic, the outcome of resilience is adaptation, right? The more resilient systems, the more likely you are to adapt to adverse events and robustness. So if you are resilient, right? Uh, like an individual, like a resilient student, the outcome of being a resilient student to adopt different strategies of study, study different fields, you know, maybe the other countries and so on, should be more learning and a better understanding of how the world functions, right? Which should then uh, manifest itself into a, a, a great professional. Uh, so it depends very much on what is, what is the level of analysis, right? If you're talking about a research group, right? The outcome of resilience could be that research group generating a novel and grand ideas that are able to not only promote the group members in the institution of science and the global competition for science and get funding and so on, but also uh, provide their respective disciplinary fields with important concepts, important theories that will, you know, re-inject new vitality, right? In fields like the sociology, which and you know the crisis for many years, as far as I am, I'm aware, right? With many and many fields have deeds, right? The scholars are stuck uh, discussing uh, important issues, so it's very difficult to to give an answer. Uh, of course, the outcome of resilience could also be more resilient, right? So resilience is both a property, but also a dependent variable, right? This is uh, this is uh, I think some of the some of your students who mentioned there as well, right? Can we so? Resilience is both an immersion property, and as I mentioned, um, uh, systems like universities have pre-infused resilience features, right? So there is already resilience inbuilt into the system. The issue then is what happens to that, does that resilience grow and is nurtured? Or, and that's one of the arguments we are advancing, right? Through the modernization, rationalization process, such as slack and loose coupling, managers go back and say, this is bad. And in doing so, because they are focusing on uh, efficiency of function, they are removing the maintenance of function, the long-term adaptability that is necessary. So it might be bad for the bottom line to have two groups of researchers 
doing research on climate change today, but maybe down the road, if one of those groups have conflict, if one of those groups specialize in particular theories or perspectives that turn out to be, you know, not that very prominent, and the other one, then the university has, a, you know, goes back to the earlier question, has more diversity to build on and to adapt, right? And and there's the possibility to, to you know, to, to generate more ideas. I I had, for example, my uh, one of our managers of our university when I presented this idea of the post entrepreneurial, uh, she asked me, well, Slack sounds very costly, and I said, well, it does need to be. And let me give you an example from, from academia, right? The traditional way of us to learn about other fields is to go for a sabbatical, right? You go to another country, right? I go to Tampa and stay with, with Professor Chai, or I go to Beijing and stay with Professor Young. And, and often I learn more about my own discipline, right? Which is nice and I enhance my network. But off we turn things around and say, I inhabit a, a university which is highly complex and diverse, right? And most universities are there. Why don't I go and take a sabbatical at a different faculty or at different research group within my own institution? That's less costly. I don't need to move the family. I don't need to, you know, to rent the house. And I may actually learn something because if I work with people that have different epistemological, ontological perspectives, I might start questioning the way I look at the world, right? And come back to my colleagues in political science and say, you know what? Uh, these guys over there in the humanities are raising a number of very interesting questions. For them, they don't buy this thing of efficiency that uh, economists and political scientists have been working on, right? There is no efficient humanities, right? Um, so, and maybe we have some interesting dialogue. Again, I'm not sure I totally answered the question, but uh, that's what I was able to come up with. I think the, the second part of the question is how do you recognize the system is resilient? Uh, do you have the, like, how do you measure that or how do you um, yeah. define that? So I would say here you do the counter. So a system that is not resilient is a system that is that is not able to adapt. So over the long term, that system will cease to exist, right? Now we have a caveat with universities, which is you don't need to adapt to exist, right? Even bad universities will persist because it's very difficult to, you know, universities for the most part don't die, uh, right? Particularly if they are public institutions, right? Going back to Finland, for my understanding, most local governments in Finland are running a deficit. If they would be private organizations, they would have gone bust, right? So uh, there is what we need to be the sensi sensitive to context, right? So we cannot measure simply. So in a private, in a private uh, sector uh, field, we could look at uh, existence and efficiency, for example, as proxies of resilient systems. They were able to adapt and so on. In a public sector, there are other dimensions, right? Uh, in this case, simple survival is not enough. Because if you are a public organization, the state almost guarantees, right? A university can run a, 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 deficit, a deficit, meaning losing money, and still get funding and survive because it's providing a public function, right? But what it cannot do is survive if it loses legitimacy, for example. So legitimacy would be a key resilience feature for any public institution, right? And the best example here is a politician, right? Particularly, particularly in a democratic setting. Once a politician loses, his or her legitimacy, right? What happened to Johnson in Brexit, even if you have a massive majority and you are extremely popular in the country, you lose the support of your party, right? And in a system like the UK system, you lose the support of the party, you go bust, right? Because, you know, it's all about the party. So uh, again, going back to the context matters and the specificity of the field you are looking at. So it's not only the resilience features of the entity you are analyzing, right? at the meso level or micro level, but also looking at the field level and see, okay, are there other features such as in the public sector, notions of transparency, legitim legitimacy and so on, right? But I would, I would say over the long run, if you are not able to adapt, if you, you know, sort of, um, what is the term that I'm trying to use, not stabilize, but you fail to, you know, to adapt, that would not be resilient. If you adapt too much, and you change the identity, that is not resilience either. That is innovation, right? This is where we have the borders of the phenomenon. And there's all these discussions also within resilience theory that we need to be careful that resilience is not everything, right? Resilience is not change. Resilience is that interplay between change and stability, right? Where we, we can still recognize an entity as it was, it has adapted, yes, but it's still a university. It's, no lo it, it's not a think tank or a corporation, right? Then it's not resilient. 
in our thank view. you for the yeah thank you very mm -hmm. much for the uh, response I think the next question coming from the uh, chat box uh, Sarah Lee uh, would you like to raise your question now or we just read out your question oh I think she's in a public bookstore so maybe noisy <laughs> <laughs> Do we cope with COVID-19 by using transformative resilience or all of them? Ah, all okay, can universities. This is actually a very interesting question because I actually have a paper with my co-authors. We just presented, uh, it's coming, where we're actually looking at how the European Union handled a crisis discourses, right? Particularly the um, uh, van der Leinen, right? The head of the European Commission. And to what extent these, um, you know, can tell us something about uh, resilience setting and resilience expectations from a policy discourse, right? So it's uh, somewhat aligned to, and, and there's all types of research going on now, also COVID-19 related, and uh, also Svetlana and with other colleagues that involved in a, we have an edit volume looking at what are, what are the impact of COVID-19 in what we call the institutional features of higher education systems, right? Do we see any major change in those long lasting features? Uh, the short answer also to bridge the second part is yes and no, right? There's a lot of continuity and it's also a bit difficult to do because to do resilient scholarship, you need long-term. And what we have learned with COVID-19, it's still too early to say, most, of, most people are doing research around the effects of crisis management, right? Which is the short-term adaptation uh, with the emphasis on the bouncing back. So when we ask scholars, can you say something about the future? It's very difficult without getting into speculations, right? And informed speculation, because the data, the data points are still very thin. That's why we wanted to go back to 20 years, at least, to look at the academic core and not two or three years, right? Um, how can universities balance efficiency and profit? How can universities nurture resilience during lockdown? Um, well, maybe taking the second part, balancing efficiency and profit, well, the two are, somewhat intertwined, right? The notion of efficiency of function is related to uh, profit. Again, depends what you mean by profit, right? In the Nordic countries, even private organizations are non-profit. So I'd also bring this idea that when you discuss these, you can have a private university, there is non-profit, right? So that means that profit or, or, or money becomes less, uh, less, of, a, less of an emphasis. Um, but of course, this is what most managers want to do is to balance, you know, you, you tackle these redundancies, the slack, because you are thinking that slack is costly, right? Because you are thinking about the bottom line. So to have, you know, uh, two groups at the university doing innovation, as of the case of, a, of an institution in Norway a couple of years ago, uh, may be inefficient from a financial perspective but it may be extremely valuable from a resilience perspective, right? So th the point here is that be careful with this short-term notion of efficiency as it is articulated by managers, which is the efficiency of function. Do more with less resources. That might be counterproductive uh, as far as adaptability is concerned because you are, you are you know, designing this lean machine, right? Designing university to be Formula One cars, as I mentioned, to run fast, and if suddenly the roads are not there, right, um, the car cannot run. So it's about think about maintaining function if something happens in the environment that you are also able to continue providing degrees and doing research, right, in the absence, for them, so in the absence of generous uh, government funding, right? That would be, which was the primary motivation for entrepreneurial universities, right, that myself and Professor Chai have written um, uh, a lot about. Uh, I'll move on to the other questions, so just to be fair. And I know that we are running out of time. Uh, maybe, we'll have the, maybe we'll have the last questions for the session today. I mean, after this yes. question. Yeah, thank you. So maybe take, uh, well, Len Lee already had that one, uh, more a comment. Sometimes it's the ability, take someone who has, do you mind if I speak in a little bit? So what would it be? Maybe we can take a last question from someone who hasn't. Uh, maybe you uh, would you like to address on this question? I mean, the last one. Uh, the last one, yeah. Uh, yeah. Does do teachers' resilience matter more? Can we compare the resilience at these two different levels? Uh, ah, okay. Compare comparing, I would say here is problematic, right? This is what I ended up. Again, we are still quite 
novices, let me put that caveat, right? In studying resilience, I am. I've been at these, uh, you know, in the last four or five years, which is nothing from a scientific perspective. So what I would say is that be careful, right? If you study resilience at the micro level, teachers and, and, and students, um, you know, what, what the study of micro level dynamics, which is what I'm trying to hint upon, might tell you it's something about uh, the resilience features that exist within uh, universities as mass organizations that may enable them to become resilient. But just because you have a resilient professor or you have a resilient research group or a resilient group of students in a particular program, that doesn't necessarily mean that the university as a whole is resilient. That's the same debate as entrepreneurial, right? Most universities have entrepreneur arms of entrepreneurship, right? Everywhere, as some others have suggested. Which can we characterize them as entrepreneurial, right? What is the threshold to generalize, right? And this is something plus this level of analysis. When you move from the micro to the meso level, right, you need to be very careful. So, for example, micro level analysis of teachers and students, and then meso level analysis of strategies and policies. What I would say there, for example, that you need a you need a level in the between. So, for example, structuration theory, the work of Anthony Giddens, proposes practices as the interplay between micro and macro level, right? So individuals go about doing their things, academic students, over time, those things get routinized, they get embedded into practices, right? Those practices over time become institutionalized and lead to other ways of doing things. So other people are doing like others have done and so on, right? And so that institutionalization, I think, right? Around practices over the long run can then affect resilience at the meso level if those practices say are counterproductive in terms of adaptation, right? If academics in a COVID-19 context say, no, technology is not for me, right? Or now we go back to the new normal, the post-COVID world and say, well, that was great to all these pandemic teaching, but now I'm back to campus. I learned nothing and I will continue doing the same exactly as I did before. Well, what about the next pandemic? What about if there's a geopolitical conflict and we cannot, you know, for one reason or another, leave our homes, right? So again, going back to this issue, again, uh, and, and goes back to that issue I mentioned about creating collective learning, right? And collective learning is how do we actually, as an organization, this is the dilemma for managers, how do you collect the learning that is in, you know, organizations don't learn, individuals learn, right? Uh, so how do you um, bring together the skills, knowledges, and expertise of academics and students and take advantage of those in a collective sense to help adapt a university that is in crisis because it lost, you know, a major funder or it was involved in a major, you know, uh, scandal and so on, right? And needs to recover legitimacy. So that's the, I'm not saying I have the answers, but those are the types of, but I would just say careful with comparing apples with bananas, right? Um, so try to compare as much as possible, the same level of analysis, programs with programs, teachers with teachers, students with students, or even students with teachers, right? And we have some examples of that in our forthcoming book related to COVID-19 that Svetlana and colleagues are also involved, all academics. And, and I know there's some great work from China as well, from other colleagues, Hugo Orta, on the resilience of uh, academic communities under, um, yeah. So sure. thank you very much, Rural. We don't want to exhaust all your energy. We want you to be resilient. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, session today, and also for all the audience for the wonderful questions and also the you know the the deep engagement of this small uh, presentation community. I think this uh, Professor Tsai, would you like to say a couple of words before we close the session today? Well, no, I think you can close, but I just to take an opportunity to thank you very much for Professor Pitello and also uh, Professor Yang for wonderful presentation and chairing the session. And thank you for all the participants and do follow our following up lectures. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. We're looking forward to seeing you again in October 27th. Uh, we were posting the uh, information of the next uh, uh, lecture on both University of Tempura website and also on the Peking University website.